Halloween of 2005 will always have a special place in my memory, but in this case, special doesn't altogether mean good. Me and my circle of high school friends were all high school sophomores, which meant that there was a lot of transitioning going on in our lives and the way we celebrated Halloween was changing too. We'd spent our childhoods trick-or-treating and a lot of the time that was in the company of a chaperone. Then from like 12 to 14 we'd been allowed to go trick-or-treating on our own. But now that we were like 15 going on 16, we figured that we were too old to go begging for candy. And unlike the year before, there was no Halloween parties, at least none we'd been invited to in any way. This meant that we were stuck for something to do on what had become one of our favorite nights of the year and the way we saw it, we needed to fix that and fast. I know we could have just met up at one of our parents' places for pizza and horror movies, but trick-or-treating had conditioned us with a need to be outside on Halloween. On such a special spooky night of the year, we needed to be out there, in the dark, soaking up that feeling of excitement in the air. The night before Halloween was a Sunday that year, and I remember that very well, because I spent almost all day glued to MSN Messenger checking to see if anyone had found anything fun for us to do. Then, out of nowhere, our friend Brian came in with a clutch telling us that we could hang out with his older cousin Cody and his friends over at some abandoned school down by the river. Cody and company were a few years older than us, and they went to a different high school, but we'd hung out with them before. And word was that they were getting a few 12 packs of Bud Light that they didn't mind sharing if we each pitched in a few bucks, and it was music to my ears. Who cared if we weren't invited to some dumb costume party with other sophomores? We were going to have a campfire, tunes, and most importantly, beer. Halloween itself fell on a Monday, and the whole day at school, me and my friends were all super psyched for that night. I get home, eat some food, and get some homework done, then right as I'm getting ready to head out, my mom pokes her head into my bedroom and drops a bomb on me. She wanted me to walk my little brother around the neighborhood so he could go trick-or-treating. It meant that I'd be an hour late to our Halloween hangout, at the very minimum, and I was not happy about that. But since mom told me it was that or face being grounded, I just sucked it up and did as I was asked. Maybe an hour and a half later, I get my brother back home, then immediately rush out again, calling my friends to make sure that they're at the hangout spot. I find out that they are, so I practically run the whole way, hoping there's still a few cans of Bud Light with my name on them. When I arrive at the hangout spot, I find it's this abandoned kindergarten that's all fenced off and derelict. I can hear the music playing already and I can smell the campfire smoke too, but after finding the hole in the fence and rocking up to the hangout, I don't see any beer except for what's in people's hands. And that's when the guys tell me that they've stashed the beers in some abandoned house behind the back fence and that since I was late, it was my turn to go get everyone a fresh one. They said that their logic was that if the cops showed up, they wouldn't be able to take all the bud, just what people were drinking. If we got busted, we could just bail and circle back and grab the beers and carry on with our night somewhere else. This made perfect sense to me at the time, so I go off towards the fence where there's yet another hole in the plastic chain link fence. I don't know what the deal was with there being two abandoned properties so close to each other, but the back of the kindergarten basically led right onto the empty home's backyard. It was all overgrown and stuff, so I had to basically wade through all this long grass as I walked towards the back door and these two big panel windows. It was dark, but I'd been given a flashlight and directions on where the beer was stashed, but then as I'm walking towards the open back door, I hear someone moving on the inside. Seconds later, under the beam of my flashlight, I see a figure emerge in the doorway. They were limping, trying to move as fast as they could, and as soon as they came into view, I recognized them as one of the older kids from Cody's group. Immediately, I'm panicking because not only did they appear to be hurt in some way, but they had this look of absolute terror on their face when they realized that I was there, and he cried out, Dude, help me. I'm too freaked out to even ask what's going on at first, but then right as I'm about to do something, the guy screams as someone behind him starts trying to drag him back into the house. I knew that I had to help, but I also knew that I couldn't do anything just on my own. I had to go get the other guys. I bolted back towards the rear of the yard, pushing myself through both sets of fences, 
one wood and one plastic chain link, until I'm back at the abandoned kindergarten. I run the whole way there, hurtling around the corner of one of the derelict buildings until I was back in the company of my friends. Then right as I'm about to tell them that we need to go get help, they just crack up laughing. I'm talking wheezing, wailing, screeching, rolling on the floor kind of laughing and I realize that I'd just been pranked hard. Everyone's all like, you should have seen your face, doing dumb impressions the way I was running and to be fair, it was pretty funny, at least for a moment or two. I remember just standing there, taking it on the chin, nodding along as if to be like, alright, you got me. Then after a while, one of Cody's buddies calmed down enough to ask me what Jay had done. Jay was the one I'd seen in the doorway, the same guy who had begged for help in such a convincing way that it was nothing short of Oscar worthy, and when I told them all that, they started cracking up again. Apparently they'd been planning to prank me as soon as they found out that I was going to be late and as soon as I'd placed my little confirmation call on the way out, Jay had gone off to hide in preparation for my arrival. But then, I mentioned to the guys how the thing that had made me run was how Jay had gotten grabbed from behind, then dragged back into the house. I assumed that they'd send someone else with him to make the whole thing more convincing. But then when I mentioned the grabbing thing, the laughter started to fade. I remember Cody being all like, What? Who got grabbed? But I took this as him playing dumb, a prank within a prank, if you will, prankception. I repeated what I said about Cody being grabbed and the laughter peters out completely. Cody gives one of his buddies this worried look then turns back to me like, Please tell me you're kidding me. I told him no, swearing that I'd seen someone grab him and that the whole screaming for help thing seemed a little too convincing. And then it hit me. Someone attacking Jay had not been part of the prank. What I'd witnessed wasn't some well-executed way of frightening me. It had actually been real. The thought must have hit everyone else right at the same time, but instead of standing there all dumbstruck like me, they just went hurtling off in the direction of the abandoned house. I followed, feeling extremely guilty that I should have done something right there and then instead of rushing back to get help. We pushed our way through the fences as fast as we could, and I can hear the older kids yelling ahead of us, Jay! Jay, where are you, man? Flashlight beams are zooming everywhere as they piled into the house, checking every room until they found him. And when they did, they found a total mess. Jay had been beaten up so bad that I could hardly recognize him. I'd seen his face maybe only a few minutes before, but in that time, someone had seriously worked him over. There was blood all over his mouth, and some of his clothes were ripped, but, but the thing I really remember was how he was awake but he'd just been lying there because he said that he couldn't move. Every time someone tried to get him up, he'd clutch his chest and cry out. There were a few seconds where we thought that he might have been stabbed or shot or something and we had to make sure that the only blood was coming from his mouth before we were able to breathe a small sigh of relief. But still, it was only a small one. If he was hurt so bad that he couldn't get up, there was seriously something wrong with him. Because we were on some old abandoned property, the firefighters had to cut through chains that were holding the gate shut in order to get Jay on a stretcher, and because the 911 call had mentioned some kind of violent assault, the cops showed up not long after the firefighters did. Thankfully, they weren't interested in the fact that we'd clearly been drinking and were much more concerned with how Jay had ended up being taken to the hospital. Obviously, I had the most to tell them, but even then, it wasn't much and we had to wait until Jay was out of the hospital to really figure out what happened. Not that we didn't visit him when he was there, he just wasn't in any mood to talk about it. Whoever had attacked Jay broke his ribs, broke the bone around his eye, and had kicked him so many times in the stomach that he had internal bleeding. As you can imagine, he was in the hospital for quite a while afterward, and in that time, the cops conducted a full investigation, keeping his parents in the loop the whole time so they knew what was happening. Long story short, the empty house across from the derelict kindergarten was being used as a stash house. The other guy said they checked the place out earlier that evening but hadn't heard anyone moving around upstairs so they just assumed the place was empty. Little did they know, there was some guy upstairs, probably some low-level dealer or something and 
course, he's paranoid and losing his mind because he can hear voices coming from downstairs. Then, later on, Jay decided to explore the house a little to work out the best place to jump scare me, which is how he ended up walking up the stairs. He said when he got to the top, it was just like, wham. The guy came out of nowhere and basically kicks him back down the stairs, and that's about the same time I appeared in the garden and turned on my flashlight. Jay gets up, limps to the door, sees my flashlight, and the rest, you already know. I think what happened that night amounts to the single scariest thing that's ever happened to me as a kid or as a teenager, and to this day, I've never seen anyone look as scared as Jay did when he looked into the beam of my flashlight and cried out to me, Help. I just wish I did something. The scariest thing that ever happened to me was on Halloween night of 1999. I remember it fell on a Saturday that year because I was a 22-year-old bartender at the time and whenever Halloween fell on a weekend like that, you just knew you were in for a crazy night. Back then, I was living in Morgantown, West Virginia, so Halloween was always a big event for the college kids, especially the seniors who were old enough to buy booze. Each year, we ran costume competitions came up with spooky themed cocktails, played horror movies on the bar's TVs. It was a whole big event. But since Halloween was on a Saturday, the local crowd was going to be mixing with the college crowd and it would be one of the biggest Halloween parties the bar ever saw. Naturally, I'm pretty excited about this. So imagine my disappointment when, on the day itself, I get a call from my boss who had a huge favor to ask me. My boss and his partner owned a few different bars and restaurants, and one was down in Fairmont, about 50 miles south of Morgantown. Somehow, they'd come up incredibly short staff that Saturday, and my boss asked me to drive down there to work the evening shift as their bartender. I could have just said no, and he'd have just asked someone else to do it, but I knew that him owing me a favor like that would put me in a very, very good situation when it came to getting off time around Christmas. So... I said yes. I picked up the smartest shirt and slacks combo I could find, given that the place was way more upmarket than the bar I worked at, and then I drove down to Fairmont around 3.30pm to set their bar up. I decided it wouldn't be so bad because since the place closed at like 11pm and the kitchen staff said everyone was usually on their way out by 11.40, I figured I could just drive back home then walk around to the bar to catch the last few hours of Halloween as a civilian. You know the deal. The shift at the restaurant dragged, but when it was finally over, I hopped back in my car and set off for Morgantown. Now what I should have done was take the 79 back, same way I've gotten down there before, but once I was in Fairmont, getting onto the 79 would have meant going back on myself, so I figured it'd be quicker to get onto the 19 and head back on a different route. That probably means nothing to people who don't know the area, so let's just say that I took a shortcut. The shortcut proved a big mistake in terms of route choice. The roads were much more winding and considerably less well lit, so any time I made up and not doubling back on myself was lost trying to drive as safely as I could. I made it about 80 to 90% back to Morgantown, still driving super carefully, and I'm literally just considering what a dangerous stretch of road I'm on when this other car comes into my headlights. It's off the road, on a patch of grass, not moving and the passenger door is open. Reaching into the passenger door is a guy who briefly shoots me this look as I drive past him, one that makes me think that he might have needed help. I could have just kept driving, pretending that I didn't see anything and made it back to Morgantown with time to spare, but part of me knew that I'd feel like a total douche the next day, just leaving someone stranded at the side of the road when all I could think about was myself. So I slowed down, pulled a U-turn, and drove back to see if the guy needed any help. I'm not going to lie, it did occur to me that going back might have been a bad idea. It was Halloween after all, creepiest night of the year, but I figured if I pulled up and the guy looked like an axe murderer, I could just reverse the heck out of there and speed off before they turned my skin into a mask or something. I knew that the person was wearing a white short sleeve shirt of some kind, so I cut my eye out for it as the car came into my headlights again. But as I pulled up, 
they were nowhere to be seen. There was someone in the passenger seat though, so I kept a bit of a distance, opened up my car door, leaned out, then called over to her to see if she was okay. She didn't reply. She kept staring off into the near distance like she couldn't hear me. She looked okay, so I got out of my car to walk over to her, but with each step I took towards the car, I realized more and more that something wasn't right about the woman I was looking at. It was a look in her eye, this glassy, half-awake look, and before I even got over to open the door, I realized that she might not even be conscious. If I'd have parked my car up at another angle, I'd have seen it way before I got close to her, but it took me until I was within touching distance of the car to realize that she was dead. Someone had stabbed her over and over again in the stomach, groin, and thighs. Her t-shirt was a dark color that didn't really show it, but her jeans were just completely drenched. I couldn't quite believe what I was looking at for a second. I mean, there was just so much blood, so much it was dripping off the seat and onto the floor of the car. I don't know if that's where she died or if someone had posed her in the seat like that, but I remember how frighteningly peaceful she looked. Not peaceful like content, peaceful like she'd just chosen to give up at some point. I remember actually being frozen for what felt like a good few seconds, but that could be my mind just pumping with adrenaline, making it feel like it was longer than it was, because it sure did feel like I'd been standing there for too long when another thought occurred to me. Where was the guy that I saw in the white shirt? I can still remember how the question made my flesh creep, and I'm not just saying that as a means of conveying how scared I was, I could actually feel it. It was like I could actually feel the terror running through me, and as I turned back to my car, I prayed that I wouldn't see him standing near it, blocking the route to my escape. I couldn't see it, but you gotta remember that I left my car running with the headlights on, and you better believe that I was looking at those dark patches around the lights thinking he could be right there, and I'd never know it. Just looking over my shoulder made me feel incredibly exposed and vulnerable, so I turned back towards the car only to see something that made me jump out of my skin. There was a tree line maybe only 10 to 15 feet away from the car, and even with my night vision ruined by the glare of the headlights, I saw something pale shift among the tree trunks. It was the white shirt. It had to be. He was watching me from the darkness. I'm still not 100% certain that that was the case, but I didn't stick around to find out. If my worst suspicions were true, and the guy had stabbed that poor girl to death, there was no telling what he'd do to me in the name of eliminating a witness. I just ran back to my car and put my escape plan into action, feeling a deep sense of relief when I finally put the pedal to the metal. And needless to say, I didn't end up going out that night. I just drove back to my apartment, called the cops, and spent the next few hours either on the phone with dispatch, waiting for the cops to arrive at my place, then telling them what I'd seen when they finally arrived. I told them what kind of car I thought it was, what the woman looked like, the exact stretch of road that I was on at the time, and when they're done taking notes they relay everything I'd said to their higher ups. And from what I can gather, the goal was to get another patrol car to head out of town to find where I was talking about, but since it was a Halloween weekend, the department didn't have anyone to spare. That's when they asked me if I minded taking a ride with them to show them the exact location where the car was. If I had gone off-road, there was a chance that it had left tire tracks, and if they really were dealing with a murderer, then the kinds of tires used on the car could end up being the difference between a conviction and an acquittal. And that's why they needed my help. They weren't so much looking for the car, which they figured would be gone already since I'd stumbled across the scene. They needed the exact spot it had been stopped at so they could potentially take an impression of the tires. Once that was explained to me, I had no problem giving up my time. If my testimony was going to be the difference in catching a guy and having a killer on the loose, the choice was an obvious one. So I followed the cops downstairs and climbed into the backseat of their cruiser. They were right about the car not being there, but I did manage to retrace my steps, so to speak, until I was looking at the exact patch of grass and trees where the car had been. After that, we had to wait a while until another unit showed up to secure the scene, but eventually, I got a ride back to my apartment, even if it was way after all the bars closed, and let me tell you, 
I've never needed to drink so much in my entire life. Thankfully, my coworkers and boss were still at the bar I worked at, hanging out after closing time and enjoying a few drinks of their own. I stopped by, they let me in, and boy did I have a scary Halloween story for them that night. I managed to get a few sympathy beers out of it and they did a great job of taking the edge off, but going back to my apartment on my own was a different story. I didn't have any nightmares about finding that woman, but it definitely played on my mind for a long time afterwards. The cops only called me once to confirm a few details about the car and the guy I'd seen, but following that, I didn't hear a thing about it aside from a few pieces on the local news. I still think about it though, all this time later, especially around October and November each year. I wonder if the cops ever caught the guy, if he actually killed the girl or was just trying to get her to the hospital after someone else attacked her. Sometimes I think I really do see a ghost every Halloween, just not in the sense people might expect. I'm not haunted by some translucent spirit floating around dark corridors. Instead, I'm haunted by that look on the woman's face. The one that looked almost like she'd given up on life. The one that made her look like death didn't scare her anymore. When I tell people the place I grew up is haunted, they tend to give me understandably skeptical looks. But when I explain it's not haunted by a literal ghost, but rather by the memory of an unsolved murder that occurred on Halloween night, that skepticism starts to abate. I tend to follow up by telling them this story, and although it might be a little long-winded, those who hear it invariably agree that Silverton, Colorado has every right to consider itself haunted. And by the end of this, I think you will too. The murder itself happened before I was born, but it definitely left its mark among my parents' generation. They were a little more protective than most and completely forbid me and my friends from playing down near this creek that we had just outside of town. Years later, I'd come to learn that the creek was where Jane Doe's body had been found, and I understood why they didn't want us hanging out there. By the way, I'm not calling her Jane Doe to protect her real name or anything. It's literally what everyone had to call her because her body was never ID'd. The only thing the cops knew was that the cause of death was consistent with murder, which obviously caused a huge scandal in our little tiny mountain town which barely experienced any crime at all. I think if the killer ended up getting caught, things would have been different. The town could have put the whole thing to bed, relegating the incident to a bad memory instead of an ongoing crisis. Only, the cops didn't catch anyone. Tips started drying up and the case went cold. Silverton didn't get any closure, so no one in Silverton ever really got over it. I mean, if you thought you had a murderer in your midst, someone who'd killed and gotten away with it, would you ever really relax? But as they say, time is the best healer, and with time, the bad memory of Jane Doe faded into the background. Cut to my junior year of high school. Me and my friends are young and dumb, Halloween just crept up on us and we're stuck for something to do. We can't exactly go trick-or-treating, there are no house parties in our town, and for whatever reason, none of our parents wanted to drive us to the blockbuster in the next town over. We were either doomed to a boring Halloween, which was just not an option for us, or we could live up to our age bracket and do something stupid and sensitive and inappropriate. I'm not proud of it, but we chose the second option, and for some godforsaken reason, we started dreaming up ways to scare ourselves. There were a few good suggestions thrown around, most of which included trespassing or petty theft, and as much as we were all dumb as a bag of rocks, we weren't bad kids. So instead of doing something thoughtless and illegal, we did something thoughtless and legal instead. Something like heading down to the creek where Jane Doe was found, on the very same night that she was thought to have been killed, to see if we could see her ghost. Yep, I know. It was heartless and childish, not the kind of behavior I want my own kids exhibiting, but that's what we did. We loaded up on flashlights, each stole a fistful of candy from our respective home's trick-or-treat stash, then met up on the edge of town to head down to the creek. We lied to our parents about where we were going, which is probably the stupidest thing we did all night, as if anything had really happened, we would have been screwed. 
but in the end, that didn't matter. Everyone found out where we'd been anyhow. So, like I said, we walked down to the creek with our flashlights in hand, and the closer we got, the more genuinely creeped out we were getting. This wasn't some suburban legend or whatever. This was an actual murder, and as stupid as it seems now, we figured that the best chance that we had of seeing a real ghost. Not only was it the anniversary of Jane Doe's death, but she'd been murdered, and murder victims always leave ghosts behind. So off we went, like thoughtless little turds, completely unaware of what we were about to find, not to mention how horribly significant it would come to be. By the time we got to the section of the creek that we believed Jane Doe had been found, we were in complete silence. Our flashlight beams wandered back and forth across the creek, almost like we were about to be ambushed by some vengeful spirit at any moment. But obviously, that didn't happen. Jane Doe was long gone. The problem was, her killer wasn't. When we saw something, breaking the surface of the water, it took just about every fiber of courage we had not to just go off running into the opposite direction. But somehow, we managed to keep it together long enough to work out what it was. The reason it had scared me so bad when I first saw it was because it looked like a person's hand sticking out of the water, and the reason it looked so much like a hand is because that's exactly what it was. Just not a person's hand. It was a mannequin's hand. Lying in the water right there in front of us was a fully clothed plastic mannequin, the kind you see in clothing store windows. We went from terrified to just downright confused. I mean, who just tosses a mannequin in a creek like that, especially one that seemed to actually have clothes on it? I think we were so dense at that age that we couldn't put two and two together to really see what we were looking at. I suppose there was a lot of stuff we didn't know and if we had, we'd have gone running the moment we saw that old thing, just lying there in the water. I don't know exactly what possessed us to do it, but one of us had the bright idea to drag the thing out of the water for some reason. Maybe it was curiosity, maybe it was the boredom-induced sense of adventure, but either way, we made the faithful decision to actually pull it out of the water to get a better look at it, and this is where my buddy's video camera comes in. He begged his parents to buy him one so we could make our own little Johnny Knoxville-style videos, but we ended up just using it to document almost everything we did as a group, amateur ghost hunting included. So... After pulling the mannequin out of the water, my buddy starts recording it with his night vision turned on, creating this creepy green and black image on the little fold-out screen. We didn't know what we were looking at, we just thought it was trash. We were so psyched on looking for ghosts that we didn't even stop to think about who might have done something like that, or why they might have done it. I guess we were a little too naive too, small town innocence or something like that, so we just left the mannequin lying there in the mud and walk back home, still looking for ghosts. I think the thing that really scared us was the fact that we'd definitely be in trouble if our parents found out that we'd been down there. We didn't actually believe in ghosts or monsters or anything. It was kind of a collective madness designed to stave off boredom. But it was that fear of getting caught that made what came next so much more difficult. In the days after Halloween, it was business as usual, and I was in science class with one of the other guys I'd found the mannequin with. Suddenly, the principal's voice comes over the school intercom, telling each class to assemble in the auditorium for a special presentation. Now, this never happened, or rather it was the first time I'd ever experienced it, so we were definitely very curious as we filed off to the auditorium. When we walked inside, I knew it was serious, because there was a cop stood there with a vice principal, obviously just waiting for everyone to arrive. Normally, Teachers had to blow a whistle or something to get us to shut up before a presentation like that, but on that way, it was as quiet as the grave in that auditorium. Not a single one of us made a sound. We listened as the cop told us about how something real bad had happened in our town a long time ago, and we didn't know it back then, but he was about to tell us about the Jane Doe murder. A lot of us already knew the rough story, but the police officer filled in a lot of the gaps for us, and most importantly, reminded us that the killer had never been caught. I was definitely freaked out at this point, and I'm assuming my buddies were too. One night we're looking for Jane Doe's ghost, then a few days later we're getting a special school presentation about it. It was just too weird to be a coincidence. 
Anyway, the cop keeps talking for a while before he gets to his point, which was that if any of us had ever saw anything weird around town, especially around the creek where Jane Doe's body had been found, we were to go to the cops right away, no matter how small it was. As you can imagine, my face is just straight up burning at this point, not so much because of what we'd found, and not even because I knew we were going to have to own up to our little ghost hunt, but because I realized we'd found something really, really bad, and that a lot of people were going to be very unhappy to hear about it. I almost didn't want to say anything, pure cowardice and selfishness on my part, I know, but I knew that we were about to open up one hell of a can of worms. But then again, it wasn't even my decision to make, because once our friend with the camera showed his parents the footage, everything started to pop off. We each had to talk to the cops a bunch of times, telling them over and over exactly what we'd seen, and they confiscated our buddy's camera footage so they could take a good look at the mannequin. From what we understood, what made it clear that something really bad had happened was the fact that we knew the mannequin was placed in the exact spot that Jane Doe had been found. But what we didn't realize at the time was that whoever had put it there had dressed the thing in almost the exact same outfit Jane Doe had been wearing when she was pulled out of the creek. It was the difference between just being some cruel prank and having serious significance in relation to an unsolved murder, but that was something we didn't learn until much later on. This is what I mean when I say that Silverton is haunted by Jane Doe. All the little developments, all the little trinkets and clues left by the person that killed her, they all keep coming in stages. It's a story that happened before I was born, but now I'm a part of it. A small part, sure, but a part nonetheless. I honestly hope the case is closed one day. Just saying the name Jane Doe is kind of painful in a way. In murdering her, Jane's killer robbed her of her identity, turned her into a nobody, turned her into a ghost. Maybe one day, that evil monster that killed her will face justice, and God willing, it'll end with Jane getting her name back. Her real name. Okay, so I went to college only about a four-hour drive from my hometown, which meant that I'd drive home fairly regularly during weekends and holidays to visit family, high school buddies, etc. Sadly, my parents got divorced around the same time I left for college, although they still lived in the same county. But since my dad was living in a small apartment at the time, I would stay at my mom's ranch house out in the countryside. So this one weekend, I'm driving home fairly early in the evening in the hopes of catching some of the hometown Halloween parties that were going on. I planned to make a quick stop at Mom's, get showered, get changed, then I'd be out of the door again and on my way to party. Being that my mom lives out in the middle of nowhere, it wasn't uncommon to just not see any other cars on the road during the drive. And that's what made it all the creepier when, as I'm driving along these country roads, minding my own business... I notice there's another car behind me. At first, I don't think much of it, like I didn't just assume that they were following me, but then I noticed the car in my rear view and how it's starting to swerve behind me. Immediately I'm thinking, uh oh, this isn't good. But I'm still just hoping it's nothing but a dumb prank, bored teenagers on Halloween or something, and to my relief, they keep their distance. But then gradually, the car eats up the distance between us until it's way too close for comfort. And still, it's constantly swerving and weaving back and forth. This goes on for a couple of miles on these deserted, dark country roads with no one else around, and I'm getting more and more nervous with each passing minute. Things get to the point where I'm actually starting to really freak out. The car isn't making any move to pass me, despite having ample opportunity to do so, and there's no way that I'm stopping, pulling over, or going home just in case they actually intend to do me harm or something. To try to shake them off, I start basically driving in circles, making as many turns as I can trying to lose the car behind me, but no luck. He's glued to my bumper and still constantly swerving like he's trying to find an opening to force me off the road. In the end, I decided to start heading back towards town where I'd been hanging out with friends at least as a way of buying myself some time. 
I also figured that since the city is serviced by a state highway, which today is a three-lane interstate, if I got up onto a higher speed on a well-lit road with maybe some other cars around, I might actually be able to deter them or at least lose them in the stack of cars. But again, no matter what I pull, the car still follows me, matching my speed, just not swerving this time so as not to draw attention. This all carries on for several miles until I, in a fit of panic, and severely not thinking about potential other options like going to the police department, pull a move of questionable safety and legality. I swerve all the way over from the fast lane to an exit ramp at the last minute, surprising the car behind me enough that he missed the exit and presumably had to go up to the next exit a few miles down the road. Having shaken my swerving unwanted traveling companion, I zoomed it back through town on the regular roads, driving probably 30 to 40 over the speed limit in a total panic in a rush to get back to my mom's house. I make it back to her house without further incident, though my flesh is crawling at this point and every pair of headlights I see behind me is making me incredibly paranoid. To this day, I can't drive at night back to my mom's house in the countryside without thinking about it. Even typing this story out now is making my skin crawl knowing that it's a minor miracle that the faceless swerving driver didn't cause a major accident. No idea what the swerving car's deal was. Never saw it again. That I know of, anyway. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. About ten years ago now, I used to work for a company that specialized in low-income home weatherization, it basically giving people free stuff in order to help lower electricity and gas bills, not to mention making the home more comfortable to people who really needed it, you know, older folks and the like. We installed doors and insulation and so forth, then collected a big fat check from the government at the end of it. Not that it mattered to me, I was just on salary, but it was great business for my boss, and it wasn't too hard of a job for me, so... I was just happy enough to do it for a while as I figured out what I wanted to do with my life. So, a big part of making sure a home qualified for free insulation was testing combustion appliances to make sure that they're not emitting carbon monoxide, because if they are, we seal up the house and it could actually kill people. It's a really, really serious issue, as you can imagine, so it's pretty much the first thing we check every time and, generally speaking, it's people's gas-powered water heaters that can be the main culprit. So, this one visit, on Halloween of all days, I'm doing a pre-inspection of a home on the outskirts of the city when I ask to see the owner's water heater. The guy tells me that it's in the basement, a fairly regular occurrence, so I ask him to grant me access, because I have to inspect it before work can start. This is about the same time the guy starts looking a bit nervous, and I had no idea why at first, but all I'm interested in is getting to the water heater so I can get on with my job but the guy doesn't seem to want to let me in, and I have to actually remind him that without the inspection, he's not going to get free insulation. Only then does he actually cave and agree to show me the basement. He walks me into the kitchen, shuffles up to the fridge, then asks me to give him a hand moving it. Turns out the entry into the basement is some little trap door that this guy has decided to hide beneath his fridge. I feel like I should note that I went and did literally hundreds of homes over the years, and I'd never seen anyone hiding a basement like that. But then, as much as it gave me an inkling of suspicion, I just wanted to get the job done so I could get out of this guy's house. It wasn't exactly the nicest place to be in. The guy had obviously really let himself go over the years, but a lot of vulnerable people had homes like that, and I never felt like I was ever one to judge. Anyway, I pull out my light, open the hatch, then shine the light down the stairs to check the layout. There are a few cobwebs down there, but nothing that jumps out at me, either physically or metaphorically, so I turn around and climb down into the cellar. Only when I'm at the bottom do I suspect the boiler is actually leaking gas, because all over the little cellar there were dead rats in various stages of decay. That's a pretty common thing if there's a gas leak. The first thing to feel it are the vermin, but then when I checked the boiler, there was no gas leaking from it at all. The pressure was near perfect. So then, what was killing all those rats and mice? I didn't see any traps or poison down there, and the guy didn't have a cat or anything. 
Besides, nothing could get down there except for the vermin that were tunneling in somehow. So why exactly were they dying down there and in such tall numbers? I remember looking up and seeing the guy looking down at me, still with that nervous look on his face and still with his hand on the cellar hatch. Seeing his hands on that hatch like that, it made something click in my brain and I suddenly felt this intense sense of imminent danger. I have no partner on the job with me. There's tiny animal corpses all around me and I realized just how hidden the entrance to the basement really was. If the guy wanted to just slam the hatch shut and push the fridge back over it, there's a chance that I'd never be found in time. Before I even realized I was doing it, I practically jumped out of the cellar before telling the old guy that I needed to grab a few pieces of kit from my van and that I'd be back in a few minutes. Then, as much as I'm not exactly proud of this, I just ran. I got into the van, backed out of his driveway and just drove off while making the job as non-feasible for health and safety as I was driving away. Honestly, I have no idea if I was actually in any danger. It could have been completely innocent and I just had a fit of paranoia for some reason, maybe even because it was Halloween and I was, I don't know, overcome with the spirit of the season or something. But I still remember the adrenaline rush and that sense of impending doom, and when I think about how that felt, I realize it's always better to just be safe than sorry, because sometimes your gut feeling is far sharper a sense than your eyes and ears. Occasionally, whenever I tell this story, I get asked if I reported this guy to the police as people tend to show a lot of concern about the dead animals. I feel a bit weird having to tell people that I didn't file a formal complaint with the police mainly because nothing I saw was entirely out of the ordinary. Crawl spaces and basements have venting at the base of the house, and it's really common for animals to squeeze in and not be able to get back out. If you have space under your house, there's a decent chance something has died down there, and honestly, you just get used to it when your job takes you down there frequently. On paper, it's totally normal, but being down there was a completely different story altogether. Those animals were not trapped down there and rats are very, very clever. They don't go places where dead rats are because it's basically a massive warning to them. I don't know what that guy was up to, but it definitely wasn't natural. But again, on paper, it was totally normal so I could only really tell my colleagues how I felt unsafe and not about my little rat murder theories which would definitely make me sound like I was losing the plot. So, like I said, I just said it was unsafe and I didn't feel comfortable going back to that guy's house again. Someone else could go have that fun, but it wouldn't be me. This happened to me when I was still in high school, living in Auburn, Alabama in 2008. It was Halloween and since we were bored out of our minds, we ended up googling haunted houses. I can't remember what the website was like or if there even was one, but there was a place like 45 minutes away that claimed to be a legitimate haunted location. It wasn't like a big attraction or anything and we figured it was on someone's land and would be like a local deal. We drove out there at like 10pm and this was before iPhone and GPS, so we had MapQuest directions. We ended up going down a pretty country road for a while with no streetlights, then turned down a legit dirt road that went through the woods, pitch black. We went down it for like 10 minutes and finally saw an old house with a sign by the driveway that was handwritten and said, Haunted House. No other cars or lights or people anywhere. We pulled into the driveway and sat there for a second like, all right, this is messed up, we should leave. All of a sudden, an old pickup truck turned on about 15 feet in front of us, facing us, lights shining right in our faces. It started driving towards us, down their own driveway, and we backed out and peeled out. It followed us, like almost bumping our rear end, right on our tail down this pitch black dirt road in the middle of the Alabama woods, and we were absolutely losing our minds. It was some straight up wrong turn kind of stuff and he stayed on our tail blinding us and almost bumping us all the way back home until we got off on our exit and he finally let up and I had no idea who was driving. I always think of what could have happened if we got out of the car when we were in that driveway and as much as I can't be certain, I know it would have been something really, really bad. 
Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash Let's Read Official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends, and welcome back to Spooky Season.